Joining me now in the studio is correspondent Sean Calebs, who traveled to the Arctic to make this documentary. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks. Talk to us about making this documentary. What made you decide that it was really important to hear what was happening there, and why should people watch? You know, really, everybody sh has a stake in what is going on up there. Basically, the Arctic, the, the ice has always been kind of the refrigerator for the world. And that is an area where the temperature is changing more dramatically and more radically than any other place on Earth. It is getting significantly warmer there. Just a couple of degrees temperature is making a huge difference. Where uh, the Arctic Ocean used to be frozen nine, ten months out of the year, now it's eight months out of the year. Uh, the, the animals that live and thrive up there that need the ice, that is melting. So we're in danger of losing some wonderful species. The people who live up there, uh, amazing people, they've lived up in that area. The native Alaskans have lived up in that area for thousands of years. Conditions that I can honestly tell you after spending just a few weeks there, it's brutal. Every time you get up in the morning, you know you have to get out in that cold. You wonder how they, they do it as well. And lastly, just the resources that are there. You know, far fewer than 1% of the population lives above the Arctic Circle. But as much as 30% of the natural resources are there. So there is going to be a push at some point in time, as long as we are an oil-based or carbon-based world, people are going to be looking to that area to pull out minerals. There's a lot of coal, uh, oil, and gas. So that's something everybody needs to keep an eye on. It's the last pristine, wonderful area on Earth. The last thing anybody wants is for that to be fouled. Sean, you talked to a lot of people there, spent a lot of time. What do they want to see for the future of their region? It's a good question. There's really a mosaic. Um, in Alaska, Native Alaskans in Canada, where we went as well, uh, First Nation uh, uh, people, and they are split, and it's very difficult for uh, people in that area. Some want development. Uh, they want to have better lives for their children, better education, better roads, infrastructure. There are a lot of towns that don't have running water. Uh, they bring water into various trucks. Uh, it's, it's, it's pumped to the houses daily. So that's their way of getting a, a better world. They want uh, education, they want something for their children. But to a lot of people, and we, we're looking at one woman there, Caroline Cannon, uh, she is just an amazing spokeswoman for the Inupiat way of life. And they're worried about this centuries old tradition, the subsistence hunting, where they hunt animals for food, clothing, uh, just about everything uh, in their lives. They're worried about that going away. Um, in the documentary, she says, can I light a stove without electricity? I can. Can my children? No. So you learn a lot about what makes the, the, the folks who've lived up there for centuries tick. And then secondly, there are a lot of people going up there working in the oil fields or working in industry. And they, it's a tough life for those people. They work two weeks on, two weeks off. Of course, they want to see that uh, continue. That's kind of their gravy train. They would simply ask, why do you come up here? The answer is always one word, money. And oil drilling, so this could severely affect their way of life, partly for the good, but um, also the concerns that they have of uh, how it could change their life in a negative way. So. Yeah, th th and again, you're getting into this 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 tug of war. Uh, people who live in that area want cash. They they need cash to survive in today's world. They didn't need that a hundred years ago and, and, and beyond that. So you're talking about two kinds of drilling. One on land, which has been done uh, in Alaska and Canada for some time. But what's getting a lot of attention is the offshore oil drilling. There are a couple of companies looking to do some drilling in the Chukchi Sea, which is basically a northwestern part of Alaska in federal lands. Shell oil had been there for a while. They were pursuing, spending billions of dollars in Canada as well. Uh, small towns in Nuvik, Tuktoyaktuk, some great, great little uh, areas. A lot of people there want industry to come as well. There was a big oil boom in that area of the Beaufort Sea uh, back in the 80s, and a lot of people in Canada would like to see that come back. So they're pushing for some development there, building roads that have never been built before, because these communities, you have to fly in. There are no roads. It's, it's really fascinating to see how people have lived like this and where there used to be little communities, uh, two or three houses, now they're moving and forming areas. There's uh, Point Hope, uh, Point Lay, Barrow, Alaska. It's, it's, it, it's amazing to go up there and, and meet the people, see how they live, just wonderful people. Sean, you mentioned Shell Oil is one of the big companies spending time and money up there, but something happened in September with Shell Oil. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think to anyone who follows the oil industry, it's no surprise that Shell pulled the plug on its efforts to drill uh, off the coast of 
of, of Alaska. It's something they had been working on for eight years. They spent about seven billion dollars, three billion just getting the federal leases up there. But oil is now trading about forty-five dollars a barrel. There's no way that any company can make money in that harsh environment. You're talking about hurricane force winds, an area where the, the ocean's frozen eight, nine months out of the year, very difficult conditions. Even getting the drilling rig up there, Shell had a couple of uh, small accidents. And I think by all accounts, Shell also underestimated the amount of pushback that would come from the environmental side of this. Massive protest in Seattle and northwestern US as the rig began moving up there. They drilled one hole, they issued a statement saying we didn't get the kind of gas or oil that we think we needed, but we want to reserve the right to go back there. And that is important. We touched upon it earlier, 30 to percent of the natural resource in the world still up there, an oil-based world, it's going to look attractive if the price of oil can go back up. If not, don't look for anyone to do any drilling there in the near time. Well, with Shell pulling out for now, does that open up some competition for other companies to maybe take its place? And, and as you mentioned, they left the door open for returning at some point in the future. It's interesting. I think a lot of companies were watching Shell to see if they could make a go of this. Can it happen? But once they pulled out, an interesting change happened uh, last uh, recently with the Obama ad ad administration. They came out and said we were having scheduled lease sales, oil lease sales, uh, in 2016, 2017. We're scrapping those. We're doing away with them. And at the same time, Shell and a Norwegian company that had leases up there wanted to extend their leases beyond 2020 and 2022 to do some drilling there. The administration says no. No way. We're ending this. No more extensions. Now, environmentalists are applauding this, saying it really puts the lid on any effort to drill in the Arctic. Because the major concern is if there would be a spill, like we saw in the Gulf of Mexico off the, uh, in the U.S. waters, and Exxon Valdez from 25 years ago, it would be next to impossible to clean up in that harsh environment. And everybody's worried about that. But uh, the, the bottom line moving forward this doesn't necessarily signal the end of it. It's a presidential directive. Obama is going to leave office. Somebody else is going to come back in. And money talks. We've seen that happen time and time again. Speaking of money, it's very expensive to live there. You talk <laughs> about the people, bringing it back to the people. What are they up against? It costs, uh, you mentioned, about $10 for a bag of apples. Yeah, it's when you go in, you talk about sticker shock, because there are small stores in these areas, and you go in and a gallon of milk's like 12, just a box of cereal is 14. And those are the items that people need to live every day. They get most of their meat, a lot of their clothes, from hunting. They eat whale, they eat walrus, they eat seal, they fish, uh, caribou, which we ate a lot of when we were up there. But bringing items in, there are no roads to Point Hope. You have to fly in everything. To Barrow, it's, there is one road, but while we were there, it was completely flooded out. So the price of gasoline, think about that. The, ga the oil comes from there. That's where they get it to make it. It was like 8 to $9 a gallon. So it's very expensive to live up there. There are some subsidies uh, that, that both U.S. and Canada are trying to do to help people out in those regions. But if you talk to the folks that have lived there for long time it's failed horribly. They're worried about what kind of money they're going to have in the future. They're worried about what kind of livelihood. There aren't a lot of jobs there. That's the bottom line. So if offshore oil drilling does not occur, how will those communities survive then? Well, uh, basically there in the U.S. there are native corporations and there's the equivalent in Canada as well. It is land that had traditionally been owned by the people who lived up there. The U.S. and Canada took it. Uh, in the mid-70s, the U.S. negotiated a settlement with Native Alaskans and granted them land. And now anything that goes across that land, like a pipeline or a company wanting to do business, uh, they work with the Native corporations and they make a lot of money that way. It, it, it's difficult to explain, but it's like a little corporation. Uh, that uh, operates and it has for some time they become uh, well adept at negotiating and, and expanding they a lot of these native corporations have uh, construction deals so they do make money and a certain amount of money goes on to each person a shareholder and it depends on how long they've lived there uh, and what share they own in that area but that is that that's the way that they have traditionally gone and the, the native corporations do a lot of the negotiating for business deals, and it keeps them above water financially. All right, Sean Caleb, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the documentary On Thin Ice, which you worked with. Uh, Andrew Smith, director of photography, that airs in its entirety next week.